Pastor was on a flight from New York to Chicago. Most of the flight was rough, and the fastened seatbelt sign was never turned off. With more than an hour to go, there was severe turbulence during which the plane shook terribly for quite some time. Even the flight attendants looked nervous, and the passengers became increasingly uneasy. Finally, one of the flight attendants leaned into the pastor's seat and said, Pastor, the passengers are really alarmed. Do you suppose you could, I don't know, do something religious? <laughs> yes, certainly, he said. So he stood up and took a collection. <laughs> <laughs> That's what a lot of the people who don't go to church think about us, isn't it? In fact, my own father told me many times as a child, all churches want is your money. I thank God that I had other generous spirited people in my life to show me that there is so much more to church life than that. And today, as we wrap up our sermon series with the last of our strategic goals as a church, I want us to consider that there is far more to extravagant generosity than just money. Our New Testament scripture comes from 2 Corinthians. You just heard Bob read it. It was written by the Apostle Paul to mostly Gentile converts, people who were not only new Christians, but new to faith in God himself. It's important for us to understand that Paul was telling them how to have a good Christian life, not how to fill the coffers of the new church. And that the harvest God is increasing for people who give generously and cheerfully is a harvest of righteousness. It's not a shower of cash. As always, Paul's original meaning applies to us today, just as it did to the new believers at Corinth. Now maybe you wonder, what exactly is righteousness? An extremely loose definition of righteousness is just consistently doing what's right in the eyes of God. Paul is saying here that there is no better way to be happy than to be doing what God sees as the right thing to do, consistently. It's the righteous thing, if you will. Still to this day, this passage, especially verses 6 through 11, is often used out of context to preach that prosperity gospel we hear so much about. A misinterpretation of scripture that says, if you drop $100 in the offering plate, God will return 1000 to you soon. This kind of preaching makes our generosity for the work of God's kingdom seem as though God wants us to head up to Penn National and drop $100 on a pony this afternoon so he can bless us with 10 to 1 odds. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Nowhere. Of course, giving to the Lord is part of our extravagant generosity, but anyone who will say that giving will surely cause you to get rich is just way off base. We are not called to give, so we will get. Hear that, brothers and sisters. We are not called to give so we can receive. In fact, it works in just the opposite way. What Paul is saying is that God has already given us so much that our gratitude should cause us to want to give generously back to him through supporting the needs of others. And yes, in our lives, that mostly takes the place of our giving to the offering when the plate passes us by. And you don't need me to tell you how important that is because of the work we do here and because of the things that happen through this church outside of our doors thanks to your generous giving. But friends, extravagant generosity isn't just about money. It's a lifestyle. It's a way of living so that every single part of our lives is generous. Verse 12 says, For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. In other words, when you're part of supplying the needs of others, there will be a spirit of gratitude flowing through you. So how about that? Giving. Our own giving of ourselves helps us to understand the importance of gratitude. Now, either you have said it yourself, or you know someone who has said, I sent my grandchildren a check 
I sent my niece and nephew a gift, and they never thanked me. Do you understand the importance of gratitude when you give? Yes, you do. Paul goes on to say in the next two verses, through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace that God has given you. Do you hear what I hear Paul saying? He's saying this kind of generosity produces fellowship and people who long to be with you because you are a sharer, because you are gracious, loving, and kind, and always willing to put everyone else's needs before yours. This means you step aside and let another person's light shine, even if you can do the job better than they can. This means you recognize that God is the author of all the good in you, and you give him the glory for all the good things you have the privilege of doing in his name. When you are a generous-spirited person, people will pray for you. And you will prosper in your obedience to God and in your ministry. And if you're sitting there thinking, I don't have a ministry, yes, you do. Start doing it. <laughs> Paul is trying to make it perfectly clear to us that God's definition of prosperity is not a big fat bank account. It's not a mansion. It's not an important title or even more grain in your storehouse or a heftier harvest. That is a human definition of success. More, more, more. God's definition of success is so different than ours is. His is a harvest of love and peace and fellowship and more people to serve and to love. His definition of success is a good life with him at the center of it. And then Paul rounds up this part of his letter by saying, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. What were we thinking, brothers and sisters? Nobody in God's word ever described an abundance of money as an indescribable gift. God's indescribable gift is more of him and a better life because of it. We've been looking at this all wrong, friends. So maybe you're thinking, well, I'd be glad to lead a more generous life, but what am I supposed to do? How do I know what God expects of me? What does a generous spirit look like anyway? How am I supposed to serve? You're not the first one to ever ask that question. In fact, the people of Israel had the same question for Micah in chapter 6. They also asked, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? They asked, just as we ask him, What do you want from me, Lord? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? In other words, they are asking him, should I give you more money, God? These are their material goods. Would you like some more of my stuff, God? What should I give you? <coughs> Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? They are asking, should I give up my most precious, my own child, to make up for the things I've done wrong? Would that be what pleases you, God? You see, the Israelites wonder, just as we do, what will please God? But Micah had an answer at the ready for them, and it's still applicable to us today. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. You see, the Jewish people have become involved in the same kind of giving that we get wrapped up in. They had a legalistic list of exactly what their tithe should be, exactly how they were supposed to behave, exactly how and when and where and in what format they were supposed to worship and pray. But Micah knew as a prophet of God that the sacrifices they gave, the worship they gave, the prayers they lifted should be an outward expression of an inward trust and dependence on God for his grace and his mercy alone. And Micah knew 
that it wasn't always going that way for the Israelites. And God knows it's not always like that for us either. So Micah told the Israelites, and he's telling us, you know what to do, because God has told us before, do justice. In other words, be fair with people, be honest, practice integrity. There's an old saying, honesty is the best policy, but for Christians, that should read, honesty is the only policy, because the entire scripture tells us over and over again, we are to be known as a people whose word is their bond, whose yes means yes and whose no means no. We are to be fair in all of our dealings so that people will know the one we represent. Micah goes on to say that God wants us to love kindness. Notice that he doesn't just say to practice mercy and kindness. We're supposed to love kindness. There's a big difference between loving kindness and practicing it. One way of describing that difference is to say, we don't do those acts of mercy from compulsion or just to be seen as a polite person. We do these things out of a genuine love for others that comes through knowing God and the love he's already given to us. I know this sounds easy, but when the rubber meets the road, it's harder to make loving kindness a reality even than it used to be, because the world around us doesn't love kindness. It doesn't value mercy anymore. In our society, those who are truly kind are often seen as just weak, too weak to stick up for themselves. And our society tends to think it's perfectly okay to return rudeness for rudeness. We think, well, that person bit me first. He had it coming. We allow so many opportunities to show kindness to pass us by. When we should be gentle with others, we are often harsh. Loving kindness and living as merciful, kind people is the only way that God finds us acceptable. And it's one of the most important ways that we get to give back to God. It's a huge way that we give back to Him. We show him and others our generous spirit by being kind, even in the face of people not being very kind to us. Notice in this passage that God has told us what is good, and the first two things are how we are supposed to behave with other people. He waits till the third thing to tell us that we need to walk humbly with God. If we are walking humbly with God, we will know what is expected of us. Because we know deep down how generous he's been with us. It's not about money, although of course that is a part of his generosity toward us, and it's a big part of returning his own back to him. Walking humbly with God is just as much about giving yourself where there is need, opening yourself to God's call to give more of every part of your life and your heart to him and his people. What Micah describes is a generous spirit, a generous life. We ask what the Lord will find acceptable from us, brothers and sisters. This is it. I heard a story about a man who inherited a rice field. He was new at farming, but he learned from those around him that the rice paddies are covered with irrigated water. In the first season as a farmer, the man saw that the irrigation water ran through his field and his crop was good. He saw that the waters overflowed into his neighbor's field, and that helped that man's crop to grow too. But when the next season came, the new farmer said to himself, why should I permit the waters to flow from my fields into his? Water is wealth, and I must keep it all to myself. So he built a dam that prevented the water from flowing into his neighbor's fields, and the result was that he had no crop that year. When he dammed up the water, it became stagnant, and created a marsh and a swamp. Now, brothers and sisters, that's how God views our offerings. We are supposed to allow them to flow through us. He allows all of the blessings that he gives us to flow through our lives, like a refreshing stream, but if we keep it to ourselves, 
We become stagnant and worthless to God and his people. But when we give freely because we see what God has done for us and the fields of our lives, then we become partners in God's ministry. So with all that in mind, what does it mean for us to say that we want to be a church known for extravagant generosity? I think it means that as the Christians who call this church home, our goal is for every man, woman, and child to have a generous spirit, meaning we are learning to put others first. And yes, this is one of the hardest lessons in life, this everyone else before me thinking. Still, that's what Paul and so many of our other scripture writers are talking about. The Bible says throughout its pages that when you have a generous spirit, when you have learned to put others first, your life will be a better place. Because the things you do will please God. You'll be harvesting more and more being right in his eyes, more righteousness. Sometimes financial well-being is a part of that, and sometimes it isn't. But joy and contentment always are. Those are God's best gifts to us for an extravagant generosity of spirit. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm certainly not discounting the joy of giving our tithes and offerings. And I'd like to be able to face Dave Hostler this week. <laughs> What a blessing it is for a believer with a generous spirit to drop that check in the offering plate every Sunday. And maybe you'll sense that it's even more of a blessing to write an extra check for one of the ministries we support. Or to challenge yourself to raise your weekly offering. But hear this. God doesn't want you to give grudgingly. He doesn't want to hear you say, I hate this. The church always needs money. He wants to hear you say, I can pack my lunch once or twice this month to pay for a disaster relief cleanup bucket. And when you're doing it for that reason, it feels good. And brothers and sisters, the more the people in our community and our world are in need, the more you're going to hear the church say, please consider giving more than you did last year. When your heart is right there where your head is, you will find that you want to find a way to help. Even if it's just an extra $5 or $25 a week. I encourage you to pray about this giving. Not because you feel obligated, but because of your faith. Because you will come to believe that is what is right. A couple of weeks ago we talked about compassion and mission and service. The general gist of which is, if you really believe what you say you believe, you're going to want to do something about it. Today, as we round out our sermon series on our strategic goals, it makes sense to say that we can't meet any of these goals without your extravagant generosity. And one of the things you're going to want to do about your faith is put your money where your mouth is. Yes, our offerings are one of the ways we serve the Lord by serving others. But again, that's not all there is to being generous. It's just as important. I'll go so far as to say it's even more important that we serve others by putting them first. An others first attitude would have us wanting the whole church to prosper in their worship and fellowship. An others first attitude would have us wondering how to help everyone to enjoy love feast as long as they come. An others first attitude would allow us to rejoice over someone else's idea of meaningful worship, even if it isn't ours. Would make us smile when someone shouts hallelujah or spontaneously raises their hand in worship, even if we ourselves would never feel comfortable doing that. It would allow us to say, well, that's not my cup of tea, but I'll support it in spite of my leanings because it makes others happy. It brings other people close to Christ where I already live because God wants me to put others' needs before my own and maybe even their desires. Extraordinary generosity would say, whatever I can do to help others to find the joy of the Lord for their lives, I will do. I will give my offerings toward it. I will lend my support to it. I will pound nails, move furniture, knock on doors, give up my old notions and jump on someone else's bandwagon. I will strike up the band myself if it is in my gifting to do so. It's not an attitude of, hey, what they're doing isn't my thing, so it must be a wrong 
wrong thing. This attitude we need to develop says, I want to support those other Christians in their stuff. And I want them to be with me and for my stuff. But I'm a big enough person, I'm a generous enough person to make the first move in their direction. And until both ends meet, brothers and sisters, no matter how much money we give, we're never going to be able to say we meet our goals for dynamic faith development, inspired worship, extraordinary hospitality, or compassionate mission and service. Do you see? Extravagant generosity is the common thread that binds all of these things together into God's one big plan for us as a church. And he has promised us a harvest of righteousness in return for our generosity of spirit. May he inspire each and every one of us to come closer to his goal for our generosity right now and in the days to come. Amen.